And really, this is the lesson for last week, but it's so important. I want us to cover both of them, the one on the resurrection and the one on the greatness. The greatest of these is love. In the uh, book of 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 13th chapter, 14th chapter, we have Paul dealing with the problems that they were having with regard to miracles, that we need to see the context out of which this is, this is written. In the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, Paul names all of the spiritual gifts and urges them to seek the better gifts. There were those, of course, it appears, that were, that were looking for uh, showy gifts. They, there were some gifts that were more, uh, at least uh, they, were, they thought more highly of those particular gifts because they were very showy, such as talking in tongues and and the ability to heal and do things of that nature. And they uh, somehow in the church at Corinth, there were those who valued those gifts above other gifts and desired those particular gifts. So Paul goes ahead and he names the gifts. Now I'm going to turn to the 12th chapter just for a moment for us to get the context in this. He is saying here, <coughs> Uh, that there be no business, this is beginning in verse 25, he says, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one of another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, for you're all the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set in the church first apostles, secondary prophets, third teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret. And then in the last verse he says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Yet I show unto you a more excellent way. That's the last verse in the passage. And then that more excellent way is not a spiritual gift that is a miraculous gift. It's the gift of love. And it's within the reach of everybody. Every one of us could have this wonderful gift, the gift of love, the more excellent way that he's talking about. And we are commanded to. We need to understand the importance of having the kind of love that the Lord would have us to love. And uh, we'll, get in, we'll get into this, but I want, I want you to, to understand he, the kind of problem they were having. We talked about this matter of the body of Christ, members in particularly, and everyone is valuable. Every member of the Lord's Church is a valuable member, and uh, we ought not to, uh, to look down upon those who perhaps are not as talented in the sense that they do not have the, uh, all the gifts that someone else has. Uh, during our meeting, Brother Jimmy talked about this matter and, and said, uh, he, he, he said, I have a sermon on the two-talent man. The two-talent man is what most of us would identify ourselves with. On the other hand, as you compare the two-talent man with the five-talent man, they both received the same at the end. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, the two-talent man wound up being a four-talent man, but the, the other guy, the five-talent man, wound up being a ten-talent man. Is it always a great blessing to a person, though, to have tremendous amount of talent? To whom much is given, much is required. And uh, it sometimes is a burden for a person to have tremendous talents. There are other problems with it too. We have a tendency, if we, if we have a lot of talent, to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. If we don't have a great, great deal of, if we're a two-talent man, it's a lot easier to be humble about it. You see, we don't feel like we're better than anybody else. And that's very important for us, for us to stay humble no matter what the situation is. We simply must not be like the one talent guy who buried his talents because 
uh, he didn't feel like it was very valuable. And uh, he, uh, he was afraid he would, uh, when the Lord came, he would be condemned, and he was. So all of that to say, desire the best gifts. He says, desire the better gifts, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Now, of course, we're in a day and age when these miraculous gifts are, are no longer available. But the more excellent way is so important. It is that way of love. And so he begins with this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. Is a sounding brass particularly pleasing to the ear? No, that's the idea. Sounding brass, tingling cymbal is not pleasing to the ear. Brother Marshall Keeble. <laughs> one of the most entertaining and interesting speakers I've ever, he could have, he could have been extremely wealthy if he, if he had decided to go into the entertainment world. I remember being at Lipscomb, hearing him speak at Lipscomb, and he was speaking on their lectureship there, and uh, he gave a good lesson with regard to spiritual things, but in the process he was, he was so entertaining at the same time that actually I laughed and laughed and laughed to the, till I had to rub my face because my face was hurting from laughing. Nobody, no comedian has ever had that kind of effect upon me. Brother Keeble was absolutely a remarkable person. And they used to ask him, they would say, Brother Keeble, why do you tell all of these stories and things? He says, well, it's like going to the dentist. When you go to the dentist to have your tooth pulled, the first thing he does is put some Novocaine in there. So you won't feel so bad when the tooth is pulled. He says, and I, I say these things, and then when I preach, they don't feel so bad when, uh, when their, their beliefs are contradicted by the Scripture. Well, at least it was effective. He baptized hundreds of thousands of people, converted whole congregations, came here to Lakeland and to Tampa and to St. Petersburg. Great, great numbers of people were baptized into Christ by that. So he had a, he had a marvelous talent in that regard. But I, I say all that to say one lady came to him, Brother Keeble, she says, she was so impressed by him thought he was so terribly wonderful. He said, Brother Keeble, you sure are a sounding brass and a tingling cymbal. <laughs> well, that wasn't, what, that wasn't really what she intended. This is not a compliment. <laughs> though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am what? Nothing. A person can have all of that. And if he doesn't have love, his life comes down to a zero. Now that's, that's kind of sad, isn't it? A person, we may not, we're not in that kind of position of having these gifts, but it's still true that God can have given us so very much. All of the talent, all of the money, all of the ability, everything we, we just look back at people like this and we say, my, my, wouldn't it be wonderful to have all that that person has? He has everything. But if he doesn't have love, it amounts to nothing. The lack of love causes division in the Lord's church. You think about that. The scripture points out that we are to love one another and by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Amen. So it's true that in New Testament times they had this wonderful, Lord commanded them to have that kind of love. And they, they took it seriously. By the time you get to Tertullian, they had developed a reputation, the Christian, even their enemies, those who were uh, against them had to c compliment them on the fact that they had marvelous love. But love is so important that it, 
we, if we do not have it, it's difficult for congregations to stay together and our brethren have divided and divided and divided, not over issues, but over personalities, over, over things of uh, just things that are not really that important. And when it comes to matters of doctrine, we certainly need to stand for truth. But uh, when it comes to personality, when I went to India, Many, many years ago, 1976, I was instructed to, t to teach from 1 Corinthians the, uh, well, to deal with this matter. There were thousands and thousands of people being converted in India. The churches uh, were numerous and great numbers were obeying the gospel and they were staying faithful for the most part. But there were no large congregations. Why were there no large congregations? Because there was enough envy and jealousy among those who were Indian preachers and others in the church that they could not stay together. And uh, that's, that is a sad, sad situation. Churches divide over those kind of things and then other problems begin to creep in later of a doctrinal nature. Okay. So, if we are to love one another and stay together and work together, we're going to have to have this kind of love. And he goes ahead to say, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love is the more excellent way. We must have it. If we are to improve our families, we have to have love. If we are to improve our congregations, we must have love for one another. When people come through the door of the church, they, they're interested in whether or not you're friendly. In fact, they begin to form, form an opinion out on the parking lot when they meet you out there on the park. It doesn't take long. They do it very quickly. And when they come into the building, they, they form an opinion on whether or not you're really friendly. But you know what really impresses them? not so much that you're friendly to visitors, they look at whether or not you love one another. That's what really impresses people. We need to love one another. Certainly we need to be friendly, but we need to above everything else be people that really, really love. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. But if we treat one another so badly, that we can't stay together. It is an awful black eye as far as the church is concerned. All right. So we'll look at, let's look at the qualities of love very quickly. Love suffereth long is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Love is not jealous. That's the, that's the kind of thing. It's willing to suffer long and is kind. We need to ask ourselves, are we really kind to one another? Are we really kind to our, to our, there are people that are sweet as everything at church and their homes are a veritable hell on earth. They fuss at each other, they fuss at the kids, they have a, a difficult ability to get along and there are those in the church that way and it is particularly hurtful. So we need, to, uh, we need to be people that are not envious and jealous and puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly. And sometimes we think people don't really see, but they do see. Seeketh not her own. What about the world? What are the ways of the world? Boy, in the ways of the world, I am number one. My interests are above everything else. And there are some people in the church that way, too. The Bible speaks of individuals like that. That Diotrephes that John talks about in 3 John, uh, that was one who sought to have the preeminence, was the kind of person we're talking about. So we're, we need to be people that do not have that kind of attitude, but rather we are to be people that not easily provoked. Um, 
thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. And these should be qualities that should characterize us. And if we would really, uh, if we would really want to look at this, and I think we need to regularly, it would help us if we just tried to put our own name in there instead of the word love. And can I say that Bob suffers long and is kind? You start reading all of that. Sometimes it gets a little embarrassing. Try your own name. Don't try my name. <laughs> because <laughs> I know we look at that and we say, boy, am I long suffering. You ought to see all the trouble I have. I just have trouble all the time. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the fact that when we have trouble, we are willing to suffer and suffer long without complaining and bickering and fussing and all of that and to be kind and love and not not vaunt ourselves or be puffed up or all of these things so just read the list and ask yourself does that sound like me if I put my name in there can I and suddenly you you'll come across some clunkers there and say I need to work on that one I need to work on that one Sometimes I'm too easily provoked. I fly off the handle and uh, it's not good. And we ought to get better at it as we get older. You know, the older we get, we ought to get better. But sometimes that's not the way it is. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Sometimes, sometimes families have a lot of problems as far as... Uh, uh, old people are concerned. I, I knew one old man back in back in Tennessee that uh, none of his relatives would go about him. None of his relatives would have anything to do with him. He had become so mean and so vile and cantankerous and when he died it was a long time before anybody knew he'd even died. They just wouldn't go about him. That shouldn't be the way it is for for Christians. We should love one another. So beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And then he says, love never faileth. And that's right. Let's talk about what kind of love we're talking about here. There are a bunch of different words for love in the uh, Greek language. And I'm sure you've heard preachers preach on this before. There is the word Phileo, which is brotherly love. When, when Jesus uh, met his disciples there by Galilee and wanted to get Peter to confess his love for him, he said, lovest thou me? He said, uh, Jesus said, agapo. He used the word agapo, the higher form of love. And Peter came right back and said, I phileo thee. In other words, that's brotherly love. Brotherly love, family love, that kind of love. And that was the word Peter came back with, and the Lord again asked from the other standpoint. Yes, Bobby. Of course, Peter didn't speak Greek. Oh, they they did. They. He was saying, "I love you like a brother. I love you," and that's not bad, is it? Depends on what you think of your brother, I suppose, but it, uh, that's not bad. And uh, Jesus comes back to him three different times on this, and finally Jesus just said, do you phileo me? <laughs> and, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. That's, that's the, it's interesting to look at this. I'm not sure I can always know exactly the motivation. But phileo is that higher form. It's that divine love when it says... God so loved the world, he didn't use the word phileo. That's that brotherly love. I might make this point in this connection. The word Philadelphia uh, comes from two Greek words, which means brotherly love. Philadelphia uh, carries the phileo and adelphos, which means the brother here. So it's love of... of but are all the people in Philadelphia, are they a brotherly love city, really? 
they're the ones that threw snowballs at Santa Claus. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're a little bit, uh, you, if you go into their stadiums uh, you, and you got on the wrong kind of jersey, you're in deep trouble. Anyway, so what I'm saying is here that there are different kinds. There's the sorge, which is the sexual love. The Greek had a word for everything. They didn't have everything. They, it's an interesting language, and uh, when it came, in English, it's not a word for everything, and that's true with regard to many languages. You try to translate the Bible into some languages, and you have a lot of difficulty. For example, there are languages that have no word for virgin. That they just so corrupt. Maybe they never needed a word for for virgin. Never saw the need for it. But the, the Greek languages has, has words for everything, even though they didn't have any, uh, they didn't have any hippopotamuses in Greece, but they had the words for it. When they first saw a hippopotamus, they put together two words. One means water and the other means horse, a water horse, and so they called him a hippopotamus. That's where the word comes from. But they, they have all, when we get to the word love, the only way you can tell in English what the word really means is the context. That's not true in Greek because there are several words that, uh, that translate it. And this is the highest form of love. We generally think when we think of love as that warm and fuzzy feeling that we get. We talk about a person falling in love and they fall out of love and this is the Hollywood attitude of love. But love, as the Bible speaks of it, really is a love that involves doing good for, for those that we love. It involves seeking the very best for others. And it's the kind of thing that sent Jesus to the cross. God so loved the world. And then in Romans chapter 5, we point, it points out that Christ was willing to die for us while we were yet sinners because of that kind of love. That love is never selfish, and it is something that we learn and something that we do. When a person says, I no longer love my wife, what he's really saying is, I'm refusing to obey God's command because God says, husbands, love your wives. It isn't a suggestion, it is a command. Yeah. It's not a matter of whether I have a warm and fuzzy feeling toward her, it's whether or not I'm going to do the things that love demands that I do for her good and for the good of the family. All right, going ahead with this, Paul says that love never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. These miraculous things are going to vanish away. But the more excellent way is still with us, even though all of that's gone past. He said, we know in part, we prophesy in part, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. People misunderstand this and they try to say, when he which is perfect is come. That when the Lord is, comes again, these things will be done away. No, it's talking about the perfect law of liberty. James chapter one, verse 25. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. There was the infancy of the church. They very much needed these miraculous gifts, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Bible had not been written at that time. But he looks forward to this and says, now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now I know in part but then shall I know even as I'm also known. The Bible provides for us all that God would have us to know with regard to these things. They didn't have it then, except in part. Verse 13, now by the faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Sorry, I'll have to, I meant to change the word charity there as it is in the modern speech translations to love at, at that point. So what we, what we need to understand then is that faith will be done away with at the end of life. There will be no need for faith then. We will know. We will, it will be sight. When the Lord comes again, it won't be a matter of just believing that, that Christ is the Son of God. Everybody will know it. 
And there won't be a need for hope because our hope will be realized as we come to that resurrection day and the time we'll receive the, the crown at the end of the way. But love will last on and on and on among God's people. Now, let's move to the, uh, to the next lesson. And that is with regard to the uh, with regard to the matter of the resurrection. I put this up here because I think it's important for us to understand the background of that. In the first few verses of the 15th chapter, we find him saying, "Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, uh, which also you've received, and wherein you stand." He was the one that had preached to the church at Corinth that which he refers to as the gospel by which he says you're saved if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received. This is what the, the gospel is. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's number one. Verse four, that he was buried. That's number two. And that he arose again the third day. That's number three. Death, burial, and resurrection is, are the facts of the gospel. It's the foundation of it. But there were some who didn't believe in the resurrection. And he goes ahead to say that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, then of a five, above five hundred brethren at one time, the greater part of which are, uh, remain present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, apparently the brother of the Lord, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. I'm least of the, all the apostles, he says, because I had, he had persecuted the church. Now we get to this text. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection? That's an obvious contradiction. There were some saying there is no resurrection, but the very gospel that they had believed and obeyed was one that said Christ was raised. And he says, if Christ be not raised, look at the consequences. Our preaching is vain. Your faith is vain. Yea, we are also false witnesses of God because we have testified that God raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead raise not. For if the dead raise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins, and they which are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. The brethren at Thessalonica were worrying about this too, weren't they? They didn't understand. Paul said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. And he goes ahead to explain that those who have died in Christ would raise first that the living would not even precede them when the Lord came again. So he says those who had fallen asleep would have perished if there was no resurrection. There were some who just felt like the only ones who will participate in the wonders when the Lord comes again are those who are still alive. No, the dead will raise first. If in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable. That's certainly true. Uh, we need to understand that the, uh, there is hope beyond. We talked about faith, hope, and charity, and faith, hope, and love. There is that hope. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep? The fact that Jesus raised indicates that we too will raise. Ultimately, he will come again and we will raise to be with him. The Bible teaches certain things are absolutely certain. Remember the statement in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 and 29, it is appointed unto all men to do what? To die. Then there will be the resurrection. There will be the judgment and all of those things. But these things are appointed People are interested in all of this, and they wonder about the resurrection. They wonder what kind of body we're going to have and all of that. Paul, rather, John says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, except that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll, we're going to have 
whatever kind of body the Lord wants us to have, and we don't know, we don't understand what all of this is like, but we, we trust that we shall be like him, we shall see him as he is. And the, the first verse of that chapter says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And what this is saying is, here's something that's awesome. We use the word awesome too much. Kids really like the word awesome. I told my daughter Elizabeth that, uh, talking about her son-in-law and his friends, that all of them had the same wife. I knew they had the same wife because when you look on the internet, Every one of them will explain to you that I have, the most, I have the most awesome woman in the world for a wife. And those are the words they use. I figured if, if they all have the most awesome woman in the world, it can only be one of them. They must be, all be married. But it's that overuse of the word. It is something that is awesome. And so we, uh, we need to understand, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. If sons of God, then fellow heirs. That's what he goes ahead to point out. All right. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection, came also the resurrection of the dead. Christ the first fruits, there will be that resurrection. And we need to look forward to that occasion. Now we move on to this, toward the latter part of this chapter. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So then this corruptible shall have put on, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You'd be surprised how many people, even Christians, do not understand that there will be a resurrection of the body. Now, I don't know, maybe they worry about the fact that, well, what if, you, what if your body burns up? What if you're lost at sea? And the body is decomposed, or you're eaten by the fish, or whatever it is. Uh, is it going to be a problem for God to resurrect the body if it's been destroyed? Of course not. He made it from dust to begin with, and he can bring the resurrection. But the Bible does teach a bodily resurrection. Not that the Spirit, the Spirit is already there. The Spirit hath gone to be with God already. And it says, them shall he bring with him. But then there will be that resurrection. We may not understand it, but that's exactly what the Bible does teach. Thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then this final statement here. Wherefore, and this is the conclusion to all of that. After all of this is said, he says, wherefore, or therefore, We've always said when you see the word therefore, just ask yourself, what's it there for? It's a conclusion. This is the conclusion. My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Can you say that about any other kind of work? A lot of things we think of as being very, very important wind up being worthless and useless. A person can work very, very hard trying to invest in the stock market and the bonds and all of those things and speculate and lose all of his money 
And boy, is that in vain with all that labor and all that sweat and all that worry that, that goes with that kind of thing. And a person can work very, very hard and be unsuccessful in whatever business he is in. Most businesses, most business startups do not last very long, do they? They quickly out of business for one reason or another. So much of what man does is vain. But this one thing, he says, we are to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Christianity is a work. It is a way of life, but it involves a work. Jesus said, I must work the work of him that sent me. For the night cometh when no man can work. But be sure of this, that our labor is not in vain. Scripture says even a cup of what? Water. Cold water. Even a cup of water given in uh, the Lord's name. Now, we don't think much of a cup of water, do we? Maybe we think a cup of hot chocolate would be nice. Or uh, some kind of uh, beverage that, uh, that we particularly enjoy. But he's just saying a cup of water given in his name. So all things whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. That's the way we need to, it's not just that we, we do all of these other things, you know, and that's our secular life, and somewhere there is the spiritual life. We keep it in a little box, bring it out on Sunday, go to church and, and do our spiritual things, and then we go back home and it's the secular. The Christian is a Christian all of the time. On the job, at home, in the community, wherever we are, and as a Christian should have an influence for good and understand that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Does it sometimes happen though that when you try to do something for the Lord that it doesn't accomplish anything? It seems that way. But sometimes what we think of as not having any results. We just don't look at it long term enough. I've mentioned this several times. One of my teachers in college had been a missionary. He came and uh, visited a family that uh, were unfaithful. He was the local preacher of that congregation. He came and visited this family uh, that had been unfaithful and tried to get them back in church and it didn't accomplish anything. They didn't come back to church. They didn't become faithful. And so he thought, well, that was a wasted visit. But what he didn't know at the time was that there was a little 10-year-old girl. And she was listening to all of this. She wasn't a part of it. She was just listening back in the back part of the house and she, she saw what he said and uh, his interest and, and his concern. And she became ultimately, she came to a Christian college, became a missionary and went into work in Africa for a great number of years. And she directly associated that impression that he had left upon her as the thing that started all of this. You never know. You simply never know. When you give a track, when you speak encouraging words to someone who is going astray, whenever you do anything that is an influence for good, you never know. It's like throwing a stone in a pond. Have you ever noticed how the ripples go all directions and everywhere? They just keep rippling on out. And no one knows where the influence of it will go. God help us to never give up. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yes. That's right. So we just need to keep sowing the seed. Just keep 
doing whatever we're doing. Keep on keeping on. Okay. We're going to stop at this point and we will be preparing for the service that, that follows. And